So today we're going to talk about the, the arms race during the Cold War. It starts, uh, we are going to remember, in August of 1945, when the United States will detonate the, the only atomic bombs to ever be used on human populations um, in, in history. Uh, when we drop a first bomb on August 6, 1945 on Hiroshima in Japan, we drop a second bomb three days later on Nagasaki. Some, in the context of the Cold War, some will refer to the droppings of these atomic bombs on Japan as the first act of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Some others, interestingly, are going to suggest that because the bombs were dropped on Japan, that's going to make it far more difficult and ultimately lead to no other bombs ever being used again on human populations. Because we were able to see how devastating these weapons were, uh, it would discourage any future use of them. That, that can be debated by you. The Soviets will respond to the American detonation of the atomic bombs with their own detonation uh, four years later. In August of 1949, the Soviets test their first atomic bomb. They do it far faster than we had ever thought they were going to be able to develop their bomb. Of course, how did they do it so quickly? Espionage. Through, through espionage, through infiltrating the American Manhattan Project. So the bomb that the Soviets would test in 1949 is going to be virtually identical to the bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, this will speed the United States development into a more advanced and more devastating nuclear weapon. And we will test that first in 1952 uh, with the detonation of the first hydrogen bomb in human history. So typically we refer to bombs before the hydrogen bombs as atomic bombs or A-bombs. After the hydrogen bomb, now we have the H-bomb. So when you see H-bomb, that's hydrogen bomb, A-bomb, atomic bomb. I can't, I'm not smart enough to get into the weeds of the physics of it all, but the atomic bomb is a, a bomb that is, that is um, where the, the energy comes from uh, nuclear fission, like splitting atoms, whereas the hydrogen bomb comes from fusing atoms together that don't want to go together. Um, and... Uh, it is far more devastating. The bombs we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we measure their explosive power in, uh, in kilotons, meaning like a thousand tons of, of dynamite would make a commensurate explosion to one kiloton. Um, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were like in the five to ten kiloton range, so five to ten thousand tons, and a ton is of course two thousand pounds. So you can imagine like 5,000 little stack, well, that'd be big stacks, 5,000 stacks of 2,000 pounds of dynamite that would make like a Hiroshima-type explosion. The hydrogen bombs, we measure those in megatons of explosive power. So uh, we started testing bombs that were in the 5 to 10 and eventually around the 20 megaton range. That would be like 20 million tons of, of dynamite. Or a thousand times more devastating than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So one hydrogen bomb is the equivalent of, say, a thousand Hiroshimas or a thousand Nagasakis. Of course, because we're in an arms race, the Soviet Union is working to develop their own hydrogen bomb, and they will test that in 1953. The development of hydrogen bombs doesn't stop. They continue to grow larger and more devastating, culminating in the early 1960s, 1961, when the Soviet Union will detonate a bomb that they call Tsar Bomba, which is a 60 megaton blast. So 60 million tons of TNT, or, or 60,000 times bigger than um, a one kiloton bomb. Uh, and that was in 1961. So these are, are, are devastating weapons. And in, the, in their earliest years, they are transported by heavy bombers. Okay, we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, with, with airplanes. So in the earliest years of the arms race, uh, we can develop the bombs, but the next question is how do we get them to where we want to get them? And these are what we refer to as delivery systems. How do you get your bomb from point A to point B? In the earliest years, we used, um, we used aircraft. 
But aircraft are not the best option for delivering, uh, delivering these bombs because aircraft are big, they fly relatively low, and they fly relatively slow. So they can be shot down easily by enemy anti-aircraft fire. So both the United States and the Soviet Union quickly began working on long-range missiles using rocket technology that was developed during the Second World War to put a nuclear warhead atop one of these rockets and have it travel uh, long distances. By the 1950s, the Americans and the Soviets had both developed what are known as intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And these are missiles that can travel, say, from the United States and make it all the way over to the Soviet Union or vice versa. Not every ballistic missile is an intercontinental ballistic missile. These were the most advanced and long-range ones. There were also medium-range and intermediate-range ballistic missiles. When we talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis the other day, our concern in Cuba was that there were medium-range ballistic missiles put in Cuba because that could hit most major cities in the United States, including Washington, D.C. In 1957, you remember we talked about uh, the Soviets launching Sputnik? Sputnik, obviously it's the first artificial satellite put into orbit, but what really scared us about Sputnik is that the Soviet Union had the missile capability or the rocket technology to get Sputnik into orbit. And this gave Americans concerns that a missile gap was growing between the Soviet Union and the United States. In reality, that missile gap never actually existed. It was, in, it was assumed to exist by president, or president candidate, presidential candidate John Kennedy when he was running against Republican Richard Nixon. He spoke of the missile gap, but he didn't really have all of the information that said, no, this wasn't a thing. And President Eisenhower nor Vice President Nixon, they weren't at liberty to talk about the non-existent missile gap because that was classified information. So for all of the 1950s up to the uh, mid-1970s, the United States actually had more uh, nuclear warheads than the Soviet Union had. All right? Then, of course, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union will surpass the United States. Um, and into the 1980s, they've got far more than the United States. But once you get to having 25,000 nuclear warheads, you're okay. You're not really worried about any missile gap. It's kind of like... If you go to White Castle and you buy 20 White Castle burgers and your friend buys 30 White Castle burgers and you can notice that there is a White Castle gap between the two of you, but it doesn't really matter because each of you can do equal damage in your own bathroom. All right? <laughs> okay, whatever. So, so the missile gap eventually does exist. It eventually does exist, but it only exists at a point where we feel perfectly comfortable having the amount that we have. That, that's 20,000, 25,000 warheads on each side is absolutely enough to do every bit of damage that you would ever want to do. Now, aircraft and intercontinental ballistic missiles aren't going to be the only delivery systems that, that will exist. Uh, the United States will first, in 1959, successfully de or, or test and, and deploy what are known as SLBMs, sub-launched or submarine-launched ballistic missiles. So this is, you can see, coming out of the ocean. There is a submarine underwater here and a ballistic missile being fired out of a submarine. We launch our first uh, sub-launched ballistic missile in 1959. The Soviet Union follows suit in 1960. And so now, if you can shoot the aircraft down, or if you can target all of your enemy's intercontinental ballistic missile sites, you might still have hope that a submarine anywhere in the ocean could deliver a nuclear warhead to your enemy. This is what's known as the nuclear triad, or the Cold War triad. The nuclear triad is the three legs of, of nuclear weapons, whether they be ICBMs, sub-launch ballistic missiles, and long-range bombers. And the idea is it would be virtually impossible for your enemy to knock out all three ends of this triangle. You might be able to target to get the planes as they come in. You might be able to hit many of the, the ICBM sites. 
you might be able to get some of the subs, but to neutralize all of these would be very, very difficult. Anybody watch the Republican debate the other night? Yeah, this came up in the Republican debate, uh, still talking about a nuclear triad. Uh, Donald Trump had a hard time with this one. Donald Trump was not sure. I, he knows what it is today, but he certainly did not know what it was when it came up in the debate. And he was asked about it a couple times, and he was not able to give a coherent understanding as to what, what this meant. Um, but now you guys know. So you are, short of your age, qualified to be president now. Yes. Or at least as qualified as the front runner in the Republican Party. Um, in the 1950s, in the 1950s, both the Americans and the Soviets, in, a, in addition to growing their offensive capability with their nuclear weapons, were very concerned about creating defensive uh, technologies against a nuclear attack. The United States would work with Canada to build a line of, of radars across northern Canada that would be able to detect incoming missiles coming into the United States. And we also worked in the 1950s to develop what are known as anti-ballistic missile systems, ABM, anti-ballistic missiles. So a ballistic missile is going to deliver the weapon. An anti-ballistic missile is a missile that is made to shoot down another missile. And this is a uh, United States Army Nike missile, you guys can see here. And the United States would deploy these Nike batteries all throughout the United States surrounding major urban centers. And so if we look at this map here, you can see everywhere there's pretty much a big city in the United States, or also in some cases not so big cities, but missile defense, or like nuclear silos for intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, although I'm surprised they don't have anything around uh, NORAD. But anyway, anywhere there are big cities, there were Nike defense sites, including our, our area. Detroit was a major city in the 1950s and 60s, right? Um, and there we, had, we had Nike batteries at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. There were Nike batteries at uh, Riverbends Park in Utica. Um, so, and you guys, the site is still, like remnants of the, the original site are, is still there. Yes, ma'am? How would they work? Oh, uh, man, I'm not nearly smart enough to explain how they work, but basically they're smaller missiles that you fire at bigger missiles. And, um, yeah, well, it, it wouldn't necessarily detonate the, the, the nuclear device. Uh, it, there would be an explosion from the, from, the, from the collision, but it wouldn't necessarily detonate the nuclear device. Um, So that wouldn't be a good situation, but certainly better than the, the oh, missile getting where? It's called a Nike. Nike, yeah, Nike. Like the messenger god, right? Nike messenger god? Goddess. Goddess? Nike was a girl? No. Well, yeah, but can't Nike, a boy Nike wear wings? Nike's a guy. Hermes. But isn't that just Greek and Roman issues? Well, we have a Greek mythology, oh, Roman mythology issue here. <laughs> so it's a girl. Ah, look at me go. Well, hey. Nike is the goddess of victory. So I'm totally messed up. So why am I, why am I thinking Hermes? Hermes is the messenger guy. Yeah. Ah. Man, good thing I'm not recording this for people all over the world to see. Okay. Hermes has wings on his shoes? Oh, just on his shoes? Okay. Maybe that's what I was thinking. But Nike's got wings all over the place? Like regular wings. Okay. Anti-ballistic missile systems. The missiles that could shoot down other missiles. All right. So now if we're developing like successful anti-ballistic missile systems, we're going to have to come up with a way to avoid those. And in 1970, the United States will first successfully test what is known as a MIRV, a multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle, a MIRV, a multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle. You don't need to remember that acronym. You can just call it a MIRV if you want. And essentially, it is a rocket 
that has many nuclear warheads on it, and as that rocket will make its way towards our enemy, it can deploy multiple nuclear warheads that would be far more difficult for any anti-ballistic system to neutralize. We developed a MIRV in 1970. The Soviets would develop their own by 1975. So this is what we refer to when we talk about the nuclear arms race, is the development of all of these things. The next question is, oh, how are we going to use them or ultimately not use them? Both sides, both sides throughout this Cold War are going to acknowledge that using these weapons, especially as we get into the 1960s, 70s, when we have thousands of them, that actually using these weapons would result or could result in the end of the world. So the weapons actually became, rather than offensive weapons, Nuclear weapons began to be seen as a deterrent to war. Much like when I mastered four different martial arts. It's not so, I, I haven't gotten into a fight since, all right? People used to mess with me a lot. Then I, then I became a master of karate, hung, kung fu, kung fu jiu-jitsu, and what's the fourth one? A quiz ball? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now no one messes with me because they know it would be futile, right? Well, much like my skills in the fighting arts, nuclear weapons became a deterrent to using, any, using the nuclear weapons. Because we have these weapons, these weapons won't be used. But that doesn't mean through the course of, our, of their existence that we won't threaten or the Soviets won't threaten to use them. Of course, President Eisenhower, as part of his new look, dramatically increased our nuclear arsenal. And he and his Secretary of Defense, a guy named John Foster Dulles, threatened to use them to massively retaliate against Soviet or Chinese aggression. President Kennedy would, would modify this strategy with what's known as flexible response. As we talked about the other day, Kennedy had a little bit of a problem with the idea of our only two choices in the advent of Soviet aggression would be massive nuclear retaliation or humiliation as we didn't follow through with what we had threatened. So Kennedy's response is going to be known as flexible response, where he will beef up our conventional arsenal while still maintaining a nuclear arsenal. And Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, a guy named Robert McNamara, we've talked about him a lot, and we'll talk about him a lot more. Robert McNamara developed what was known as the counterforce strategy. To use smaller, more tactical nuclear weapons. All right, hold on. Yes, sir. Intercontinental ballistic missile. The, uh, ABM. Yep, anti-ballistic missile. Robert McNamara would develop what's known as the counterforce strategy, where we would use smaller tactical nuclear weapons, and here I'm going to call a timeout again, strategic weapons, strategic nuclear weapons versus tactical nuclear, wep nuclear weapons. Um, when we talk about strategy, we tend to talk about the big picture, like the overarching strategy to win a conflict. When we talk about tactics, we talk about how do I maybe execute this battle or execute this operation? Think of strategy as the forest. Think of the tactics as the trees, all right? So a, a strategic nuclear weapon, these are our frontline defense. These are our hydrogen bombs. These are the ICBMs. These are the big boys. Tactical nuclear weapons are much smaller and more focused, still devastating. Like, you might have a tactical nuclear weapon that is like a Hiroshima-sized explosion. But it can be more pinpointed, as much as you can pinpoint that, targeted against your enemy's armies. So this is uh, McNamara's, Secretary of Defense McNamara's counterforce strategy. To develop strategies that would use tactical nuclear weapons against enemy armies, rather than targeting your enemy's civilian populations with strategic bombs. Tactical. Tactical versus strategic, yeah. The Cuban Missile Crisis, though, in 1962 changes everything. 
Because in that crisis, we got as close as we had, will, will really ever get during the Cold War to actual nuclear warfare. And it's going to show Kennedy and McNamara, who's going to be around for longer, obviously, it's going to show them that nobody would survive an actual nuclear confrontation. And because nobody would survive an actual nuclear confrontation, neither side is really willing to start one. As tense as the Cuban Missile Crisis got, neither side was willing to go nuclear because of what that would mean to themselves. This is going to develop into what is known as MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. And it sound, kind of sounds like a joke, but it's the legitimate belief of not only the United States, but also the Soviet Union uh, during the height of Cold War nuclear threats. Mutually Assured Destruction. If you attack me, I will respond and we will destroy each other. And because we each know that we will destroy each other, you will never attack me, nor will I ever attack you. That's mutually assured destruction. As long as we can each guarantee that we can each destroy each other, no matter who shot, shoots first, as long as we can keep that guarantee, mutually assured destruction will keep us safe in a crazy, weird, backwards thinking way, right? So you have these most devastating weapons, and you have them in orders of magnitude by the thousands, right? And that is what guarantees that you will never use them. Guys, today, even, nuclear weapons are seen as a deterrent to war. Like, the Cold War ended. We never got rid of, we got rid of many of our nuclear weapons, but we still absolutely have a massive arsenal that can destroy the world many times over if need be. But why does, like, Iran want to develop, well, they're saying they don't want to, but why do we believe Iran wanted to develop a nuclear weapon? Why does North Korea want to develop a nuclear weapon? Why did we believe that Saddam Hussein wanted to develop a nuclear weapon? Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and, but, but what it would ultimately do is guarantee no one would try to invade them. It's, a, it's a seen as a deterrent. You, you develop an atomic bomb. Yes, you, you might threaten your neighbors with it, right? Obviously, the, the nation of Israel is definitely afraid of, of Iran ever acquiring a nuclear weapon because Iran has said they want to destroy the nation of Israel, right? But what it would guarantee, let's say Iran doesn't go that direction, what it would guarantee is that no one would ever be able to go into Iran or North Korea and do what the American government did to Saddam Hussein, for example, right? We, had Saddam Hussein had an atomic device, we would have never been able to go in and do what we did in 2003. We would have had to deal with him in a much different way. So nuclear weapons are seen very much as a deterrent to war. And that certainly worked during the Cold War. All right? So mutually assured destruction it, through like the 1960s, we believe keeps us safe. But in a weird twist, and we've got to kind of keep our, keep our uh, heads around understanding this, the anti-ballistic missiles that we had developed in the early 1950s were getting better and better by the late 60s and into the 70s. Our anti-ballistic missile technology was improving and becoming far more likely that we could actually shoot enemy weapons out of the sky. And so when the United States and the Soviet Union enter into a series of talks in the 1970s, we haven't talked about this yet in our class, but in the 1970s we're going to have some easing of tensions uh, with, uh, between the Soviets and the Americans called the detente period. Yes, Kevin? Um, harder, harder, and they, but they don't develop theirs until 1975. I mean, was the strategy to, like, knock out the bigger rocket before it was up? Uh, you know what, I... We may or may not have, the, the, we would have had a better chance of doing something like that because of our allies in Canada and, 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 and Europe. Um, I don't know if the Soviet Union was as comfortable with that. But they don't develop, they don't develop a MIRV until 1975. And this is going to come after these talks happen. So in the 1970s, the United States and the Soviet Union go through an easing of tensions that's known as detente, D-E-T-E-N-T-E. -E -E. We will talk about that at a later date. As part of these talks, the United States and the Soviet Union start talking about nuclear arms reductions. But when they have these conversations, 
the first thing on the cutting board, the first thing to start reducing, is not going to be the sub-launch ballistic missiles. It's not going to be intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's not going to be the long-range bombers. It's not going to be MIRV that the United States had just developed. It's going to be the anti-ballistic missiles. Weirdly enough, the thing that Americans and the Soviets will first agree to get rid of in order to keep each other safer are the one weapon that is actually defensive. Because it's the defensive weapon that makes it more likely that one side or the other would ever use their offensive weapons. Because you don't use your offensive weapons as long as mutually assured destruction exists. If I think that if I launch at you, you will be able to destroy me, I will never launch at you. But if my country can develop effective anti-ballistic missile technology, if we can shoot out of the sky every missile that you send at us, guess what? This starts to disappear. I am no longer assured destruction if I attack you. So the first things that start to get cut when we start discussing nuclear arms reductions are actually anti-ballistic missile systems. Which is kind of wild. Which means we like this. this. This actually works for us. We think this keeps us safe. So mutually assured destruction, as, as much as it sounds crazy, and, and the acronym is MAD, um, as much as it sounds crazy, it actually is, the United States and the Soviet Union thought, keeping us safer, keeping us from ever using those weapons. But MAD will start to fall apart in the 1980s. In 1980, the United States elects a new president, and it is Ronald Reagan. Again, we're going to have a whole day to talk about Reagan and his Soviet counterpart, a guy named Mikhail Gorbachev. We're going to talk about them much more in detail later. When Reagan gets elected, he runs on a campaign pledge or promise to make the United States strong again in the face of the Soviet Union. Reagan is going to accuse the previous administration of Jimmy Carter as being weak against communism. Because under Car Carter's administration, for example, the Soviet Union is going to invade Afghanistan in 1979. When Reagan gets elected, he will immediately move to start growing again America's nuclear arsenal. And building new delivery systems. But he also begins to pump money into what is known as the Strategic Defense Initiative. The SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. And it is quite timely that you guys can hear the, the nickname that the media gave to the Strategic Defense Initiative, because uh, this was done in 1982, 83, uh, when like right around the time when Return of the Jedi was coming out, this was known as Reagan's Star Wars plan. Putting anti-missile technology into space. So if Soviet missiles were making their way to the United States, we could choo -choo -choo, zap them out of the sky with, our, uh, with, with technology from space. This never actually happened. We never did this. We started developing it, but it was never deployed. Many believe it is not even a feasible thing to do, but the United States was pushing towards it. And because we push towards it, what would happen to the idea of mutually assured destruction? Disappear. Because if we could now shoot out of the sky every Soviet missile from space, mutually assured destruction would be gone. This is going to ramp up the tension of the Cold War. It shouldn't surprise you that at the same time that this is being talked about, what movie is going to be aired on ABC at 9 o'clock for everybody in the country to see? The day after about what happens when a nuclear strike hits the United States. Well, the Soviet... Yes, sir? If they thought that was possible, why not... If they feasibly were, would be able to stop incoming Soviet missiles, why not just stop it? Why not make the system and agree to make a, something that could stop all nukes going anywhere? Well, would the Soviet Union... Does the Soviet Union have a lot of long-term trust of the United States buildup? Like, would they trust that we would stop our missiles going as well? I would, you know, that y there has to be a mutual trust here. And but, like, the UN set up that, that plan, right? Why not money? Yeah, the UN only has funding if its member states allow it. 
And again, I think we have to run, go to Soviet levels of trust of the Western powers. There's not a lot. Um, they, would have, they would have to be absolutely trusting that this would work. And then who runs it? You know, would it be American scientists running it? It would be much, largely American technology. I, I don't know that we would. It, it sounds nice. It sounds nice. But I don't know if that would be feasible because you have to have a lot of human trust happening here. So the Soviets are not going to be able to keep up with this development. Ronald Reagan is going to pump so much more money into the American military, and the Soviet Union will prove unable to match our spending. And so in 1985, a new Soviet leader comes to power. Oh. In 1985, a new Soviet leader comes to power, and his name is Mikhail Gorbachev. G-O-R-B-A-C-H-E-V. Mikhail Gorbachev. And Gorbachev will recognize that the Soviet Union can't keep pace with the Americans militarily. So he opens himself up for negotiations with the United States. He is willing to talk with the Americans in hopes of limiting um, the arms between the two countries. And Ronald Reagan is very willing at that point to meet himself with Gorbachev. And they will meet a number of times and ultimately start working on arms reductions treaties. Now, the tension in the Cold War with nuclear arms does not mean that there will not be conventional tensions, like traditional arms tensions, traditional militaries being used. Obviously, there's a war in Korea in the years of the, uh, the arms race. Nuclear weapons are never used, despite despite um, uh, Douglas MacArthur wanting to use nuclear weapons in Korea. Mentioned briefly the other day, the Suez Crisis. Nikita Khrushchev is going to threaten to use nuclear weapons in order to get the British and the French to leave uh, Egypt. Obviously, there's going to be a protracted war in Vietnam, where nuclear weapons will never come on the scene. There's going to be a war in Afghanistan throughout the 1980s where nuclear weapons will never be used. So even though nuclear weapons are, are there and they could absolutely destroy the world, that does not stop either side, the Soviets or the Americans, from using our conventional arms to try to spread our ideas or protect our allies. <clears throat> 